All right, so uh, thanks everybody for joining. We'll now have our Q&A session. Uh, if you need to go early, then uh, raise your hand or somehow signal so that I can let you uh, ask your question first. If not, I just go in the order that I got on the screen there. Uh, let me allow you to unmute yourself uh, so you can participate here. Okay. All right, I don't see any hands right now, so uh, we'll start with Connie. Connie, do you have a question or comment? Hey, um, Eric, um, yeah. Laura, Laura raised her hand. I saw oh, her okay, I'm sorry, Laura, I didn't see you. Yeah, I know you, you, it's later there, so okay. yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Um, I just wanted to say that was a brilliant uh, teaching, really helpful, and I'm going to be doing I don't have any questions, um, but it is getting late, so I do have to go. I, yeah, I know it's late, and you got your kids and everything. Well, so good you could join us. And uh, yeah, feel free, you know, don't think that you can only join us if you're sitting right in front of the screen. We're, you know, we're always glad to have you just listening in the background sometimes. So, so good to have you. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Lovely to see you all. Have a good have night. A good God bless you too, Laura. Thank you. Okay, uh, Connie, did you want to go ahead with a question or comment? No, you you covered it so well. Thank you. That was really good. Wait, what, one question oh, I do oh. have, which is, um, whenever whenever I hear someone pronounce the name of Timotheus or Timotheus, now I've been I've always thought it was Timotheus. But I hear you say Timotheus, and so does, um, uh, what's it, Vestagian. Yeah. So Dr. McGee and all the, you know, the little um, things that I have in the CVs, they all say Timotheus. Which is the correct pronunciation of that? I really don't know. Oh, I mean, well. I just use what I've learned. I, I could tell you. I think a lot of times, even if you hear the majority of people saying it uh, one way, it may not be that way. I have an example. There was a lady that Lana knew at her work. He, uh, she married a man from Israel. His name is spelled E-L-I. And, of course, that's a Bible name uh, from the book of uh, Judges, I believe it is. Um, I always pronounced it Eli. I've always heard people pronounce it Eli. But he pronounced it as a Hebrew. He pronounced it as Eli. Uh, so, Alexander Scorby calls it Eli. Everybody else calls it Eli, but here's a Jew calling it Eli. So, you know, what's the correct pronunciation? Well, it's probably Eli, but we're saying it wrong. So, what's the correct pronunciation of Timotheus? I have no idea. I just say it that way because that's the way I've been taught, but I don't know. I think a lot of times we'll just find out when we get to heaven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't really know. So. Because I don't understand where you get Timo when it's Timma. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, Timothy becomes Timotheus. Yeah, why is that? I, yeah. I don't know. But yeah. that's okay. We'll yeah. find out. Yeah, we'll find out when we get to heaven. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Connie. Did Stan have anything? He's in the other room. You'll have to ask him. I'm good, Eric. Thanks for another great study. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Stan. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, Richard, Richard, do you have a question or comment? Hey Eric, one oh, one more. Uh, Donnie's been raising her hand. Oh, she's disappearing. I'm I'm sorry, uh, Eric. I'm just trying to help. No, no, I'm glad you do because you know now that I'm standing back here, I'm farther away from the screen, so I don't see as much as I used to. So I apologize, Donya. Go ahead with your question and comment. It's it's no problem. Thank you. Um, it, it's kind of a complicated question, I guess. I don't. I think I don't doubt my salvation, but the difference is. Um, as you know, I'm sure all of you know, right division compared to uh, churchianity and how they interpret the Bible and all that stuff. I really get down on myself because I'm, I feel like I'm not reading the word enough and things like that. But I also know that it goes back to the ADD. I have a real hard problem with it, with reading. And I do better with listening. And uh, even Lisa has suggested that I get, you know, an audible uh, Bible sort of thing. 
and, and nowhere to do that. But I still don't think that that's <coughs> going to um, change that that fear thing I have of I'm not doing enough. Right. As a believer, you know. Right. Um, you got any cures for that? Yeah, I think it's just that that would be uh, a stronghold of the flesh to think that. I mean, you know, the church I grew up in, my grandmother probably read the Bible from cover to cover, Genesis through Revelation, uh, at least once a year for at least 50 years. And uh, I was brought up in that. We were brought up, you know, you have a Bible reading plan. You read through the Bible in a year. It's conditioning in your mind that you read. Uh, for me, it was three chapters a day, Monday through Saturday, and five chapters on Sunday. That was the, the plan that we used. Um, and that's what, in my mind, I was thinking. So then when you get out of that, you get into grace, we say, well, no, I'm not required to read that. But of course, I should. I want to let the Word of Christ dwell in me richly. But it's very easy for you to feel guilty about it. It's like, oh, I didn't read my three chapters or whatever it is. Uh, the, way, the way I do it, um, well, first, what I do is I'm studying for lessons. So a lot of times I'm not going through the Bible like that. But a good plan for me is that in the morning I've got the, uh, the King James Bible on DVD. And you can do that on YouTube. You can go there, Alexander Scorby's reading of it. Uh, you can bring that up. You don't have to have a DVD. You can watch it on YouTube. It'll put the words on the screen. You'll hear him read it. And uh, what I do is I just go through that um, as I have time in the morning. Maybe one day, day I've got six or seven chapters that I listen to. Another day, I don't have as much time. Maybe I don't read any chapters, you know. Uh, it's something that, uh, we, it's my suggestion out of getting out of that mentality is just learning who you are in Christ. Um, I think two good passages to keep in mind. So whenever you feel that guilt, um, I would say go to Colossians 2. Uh, let's see, where am I going to put it in here? I'll put it down here. Uh, this would be my suggestion because you got those strongholds in your life. I grew up. Especially as a child, whatever you hear, whatever is put in your conscience as a child, it's hard to get away from that later on in life. Uh, so you got Colossians 2 and 10, and I would say go down through a verse, um, I, I'd say actually the whole thing, all the way down through verse 23, and just read those verses. It's 14 verses. It says, You are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power and whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And it goes on from there. But basically, if you read those 14 verses, what it does is it focuses you on who you are in Christ. So it's like in your mind, you're trained to say, i got to read my three chapters. And then I don't do it and I feel bad about it. Well, then you go back to these verses. So then you tell yourself, well, wait a minute. I'm already complete in Him. That's why, you know, this, I get this plaque here. You are complete in Him. You are in Christ. And yeah, I didn't do what I was supposed to do, but I've got the circumcision of Christ there. And so the body, the sins of the flesh have been cut off from the soul. And I'm not worried about me. Not, I'm not putting me under, putting myself under that guilt system. Another uh, passage, I said there are two. The other one I'd go to is Hebrews 9, uh, verse 14. Hebrews 9, 14. And I know it's written to Israel, the Hebrews, but uh, the same thing applies to us. They're washed in the blood of Christ. We are washed in the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. It says the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, it purges your conscience. Your conscience says, I've got to read three chapters. And reading three chapters a day is not a dead work. It's a good thing because that's God's word. But uh, the dead work of it is the attitude that in my flesh, I'm not that good of a Christian or I'm not going to grow in Christ or I'm not doing what God would want me to do if I don't read the three chapters. It's like put, what you're doing there is you're taking God's Word, a very good thing that we should be reading every day, and you're putting it into a legalistic system. Like, I've got to read the three chapters. So I'll tell you, I'll watch that DVD. Uh, 
I might get through the Bible in nine months, Genesis through Revelation. It might take two years. You know, it all just depends on what's going on in my life. You know, you got things you got to do. Maybe you got to go and you got to go to a doctor's appointment or you got to do, you know, well, you got to go grocery shopping that day or you got to, you know, whatever it is you got to do. Um, and maybe you just don't have the time like you normally would to listen to that reading. So then you feel bad about what well, says the blood of Christ purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. A parallel verse. I said I was only going to give you two and here I'm throwing in a third one. A parallel verse in Paul's epistles is uh, Galatians 2, 18 and 19. Galatians 2, 18 and 19. If I build again the things which I destroy. So the moment that I believe the gospel, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. The law has been destroyed to me. Blotting out that, that was in Colossians 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, was, was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The law is nailed to his cross. I don't have to follow it, I'm not under it. I'm under grace. But if I build again the things which I destroyed, a law that I've got to read three chapters a day, it says I make myself a transgressor. Verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law. Why am I dead to the law? That I might live unto God. So dead to the law that I may live unto God. And so I would say right there, that what you want to do is read those verses and whenever you feel guilty, you feel bad, you go back to these. I say, okay, what does Colossians 2 say about who I am in Christ? What does Hebrews 9, 14 say? What does Galatians 2, 18 and 19 say? I say, go back to those things. And what you're doing is you're pulling down the strongholds and you're using these weapons here. And you say, wait a minute, I'm already complete in Christ. Wait a minute, I'm not under the law. I'm dead to the law that I might live unto God. Wait a minute, the blood of Christ purges my conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I know reading the Bible is not a dead work because the Bible is alive. It's a good thing. But putting myself under a legalistic system to say I've got to read the three chapters and now I feel guilty because I didn't do it, that's a dead work because it's legalism. And I'm dead to the law. So I'm not going to let any stronghold of the law affect me. And again, it's something you're, you're in it all your life. It's hard to get out of it, but you just have to... The key is you just go back to the verses. You say, I know I don't feel like I'm serving God. I know I feel guilty because I didn't read the Bible. But what does God say? God's word is true. God cannot lie. What does God say about it? He says, I'm already complete in Christ. He says, anything I did in my flesh is cut off. It's not going to affect my soul. He says, I should put myself under the law so that I may live unto God. So just bring up these verses, you know, maybe write them down on a piece of paper, print them out, and just bring those verses to mind to overcome that stronghold in your mind. Yeah, yeah it, the, I think part of the problem, too, and all, all these verses will help, I'm sure, but I give myself these messages when these uh, thoughts and condemnation comes up. It's just that there's a layering of that condemnation that started from family and teachers in childhood, and this was before they were diagnosing ADD. So I didn't have any of the understanding that's needed there. So even though I tell myself these messages, like the ones you're telling me, because I know those words, uh, it still just comes back, that layering condemnation. But I appreciate what you've shared with me, and I'll get into those verses more. Yeah, I would say it just, uh, it's just a repeating of that. Keep, keep yeah. doing that. Keep, you know, when I, the church I grew up in taught you sin, you lose your salvation. I was getting yeah. re-saved in my mind multiple times. Yeah. And then once I learned eternal security, I'm still confessing my sins. I'm still asking God to forgive me. I already know I'm complete in Christ. I already know the verses. But it's just, that's a stronghold in my mind. And now, uh, I don't ever, you know, ask for forgiveness of sins because I already know who I am in Christ. But it didn't happen overnight. It took years and years. Now, if you've got, you know, ADD, or, um, then maybe it, it takes longer or maybe it's not total. Maybe it's not 100%. But the more you remind yourself of these verses, the better yeah. it's going to be. Not that it's ever going to be perfect. Not that you're ever going to think correctly. Maybe you always have some guilt. But at least 
if you keep reminding yourself of these, it'll it'll at least help. It'll at least get better. So. Yeah, I know you're right about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah, very glad you asked that question. Very good. I guess Lisa has a follow up. Do you have something? Yes, I I want to know when we feel guilty about something. Can we say most of the time when we feel guilt and self condemnation? Can we say most of the time that that we're putting ourselves under the law and under legalism? Yes. Yeah, guilt is yeah. all about guilt is a good thing initially. Romans seven talks about that. That what God did at first is He put, you know, Galatians 3, 24. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Why did God give you the law? Well, to make you feel guilty. You know, it says in Romans 7, 8. Romans 7, verse 8. Sin, the sin nature. Taken occasion by the commandments. There's my conscience. So I got the conscience tells me right from wrong. And I don't obey it. So I end up sinning. So sin takes occasion by the commandment and enrod in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Verse 13 asks the question, well, if I've got the law, and all I do is I just feel guilty, because I am carnal, but the law is spiritual, and I am carnal sold under sin, then what the law is doing, it's a taking occasion by the commandment to where I sin even more. So then I feel even more guilty. So if, you know, if I didn't even know about the law, I'm still a sinner bound for hell, but at least I don't feel guilty about it. Now the law comes and I feel guilty. He says, verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me? I feel all this guilt. I feel condemned. God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the purpose of the law, Romans 4.15 says the law worketh wrath. The purpose of the law, the law's purpose, is to make you feel guilty. It's, you're already guilty. You're already bound for hell because of your sin. But God brings in the law so that you sin even more so now the sin overcomes your, uh, your pride. Your pride that, hey, I'm okay with God. Well now, verse 13 says, Sin, that it might appear sin, works death in me, so that the, the sin by the commandment becomes exceeding sinful. So the whole purpose of the law is to work wrath. It's for you to feel guilty. It's for you to feel bad about yourself. So the law's purpose is guilt. But then, Galatians 3.24 says, well, the law is our schoolmaster. The law is there to teach us. What, is, what is, is, is it there to teach us? That we're guilty. So then what it does is, it, I say, well, I'm a sinner. The more I try, the more I sin. Nothing I can do to get out of it. So all I do is just rack up all this guilt and I feel bad. Well, then it says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law's purpose is guilt, but the law's purpose also is to bring me to Christ. So the problem, so the, what the law does first is identifies the problem, and that's where the guilt comes in. But then the solution is to bring me to Christ. So once the problem is taken care of with the solution, now I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. So yeah, the law is very much associated with guilt. And that's why the Hebrews 9.14 passage, the blood of Christ purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If the blood of Christ has been applied, the law has done its job, it's brought me to Christ, and for today I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. So now I've been brought to Christ, I've got the solution. So then I should never, under the perfect situation of being complete in Christ, I should never feel guilty because the problem's been taken care of. You know, if, I, if I've got a heart issue, a heart condition, and a doctor is able to take that away through surgery or medication or whatever it is, and I'm 100% confident in that. Of course, I wouldn't be, but if I'm 100% confident that the problem has gone away, I'm not ever going to worry about the heart problem again because the problem has been dealt with. So the law, the problem is I'm a sinner, and the law 
is to show me that I'm guilty under that sin. That's the problem. And it identifies the problem, and it does that through guilt. Then it identifies the solution by bringing me to Christ. And once the solution is applied, I should never feel guilty. Again, I've got my flesh. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, so I'm still going to feel guilty. But as long as I recognize Colossians 2, 10 through 23, Hebrews 9, 14, Galatians 2, 18 through 19, as long as my mind is completely fixed on that doctrine that's in those verses, then I will never feel guilty because I'm complete in Christ and there's nothing I can do to lose my salvation. And so now it's just about Christ living in me. See, yeah, so guilt is associated with the law. It's a good thing, very good thing. I need to see my guilt in order to see the solution. But once the solution is there, I don't go back. You know, if I've got a heart condition and the doctor is able to completely take care of it where I'd never have any problems again, I'm not going to worry about my heart because the problem is solved. And the guilt there is to show you you've got a problem of sin. And once that solution comes of Christ, then you should never go back to guilt. Of course, you're going to because we still have our vile flesh. But yeah, the guilt is definitely associated with the law. You should never feel guilty in Christ. If you've got these three passages in mind, you won't ever have guilt. Wow, Lisa, thank you for that question. And Eric, what a thorough, wonderful answer. I think that has done more than your first answer, Jimmy. That's great. Oh, thank you. Well, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that helped. Yeah. Um, before I move on, does anybody else have any follow-up on that? Scotty, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that what I, when I first came to write the vision, and still have times when I put myself under the law, but now I've come to where I'm recognizing it a whole lot easier when that happens because indoctrination, in Christianity, whatever religion it is, it's indoctrination. And Anybody can tell you that takes time to change. It doesn't happen overnight. But seeing these verses and knowing who you are in Christ, it becomes easier to see when you, God hadn't placed you under the law, you placed yourself back under the law and do these things. And then I, I'd have to do a, you know, a turnaround in my mind. But that, that, to me, I love the explanation and I love the clarification, but I just wanted to say that with time and recognizing it and patience with yourself, you overcome it. It just takes time because the flesh has already been indoctrinated to you are condemned if you step out of line. So that's all I want to say. It's just Time. It gives, gives yourself time and be patient. God's very patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that, Scotty. That's a real practical application of it. It's not going to be perfect. You're not going to just all of a sudden get rid of all this guilt, but it just takes time. It's a process, and it gets it gets a little better as time goes on, then a little bit better. So, yeah, thanks thanks yeah. for sharing that. It's a process. Can I ask you this? You think that's what it meant when it says that um, the blood of Christ purges the mind, because it does take that time. It's not an instantaneous miracle happening, you know? Yes, yeah, it's a very, there is the, there's two parts to it, you know, the sa being saved and your position of who you are in Christ is an instantaneous thing. The moment yeah. you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you're seated together with Christ in heavenly places, you're complete in Christ, You've got, you know, the circumcision of Christ, regenerated, indwelling in the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Spirit into His death, burial, and resurrection, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've got all that stuff. But then yeah. there's a practical sanctification part. That, yeah, that's who I am, but how do I change my mind to where I use the mind of Christ and not the fleshly thinking? How do I read God's Word and learn that doctrine and let it go in the inner man? That's, that's a process there. So the salvation... And who you are, the position is instantaneous, but then the right. sanctification is a process that takes time. It's a gradual thing. I, 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 I agree with that because when I think of a seal, I think of the seal like a, 
like um, uh, uh, whatever you call those people that sign their name that this is the truth. Oh yeah, the notary. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I can think of right. when I when I think of that is that it's just that the stamp just steals. They say I'm doing this one. Right. So anyway. Yeah. And then there's no better seal than the Holy Spirit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thanks, Scotty. Uh, you. Tr Troy, Troy, we're glad to have you with us. Do you have a question or comment? Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself in the lower left. Oh, there you go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm familiar with some of the people that are here, but uh, I haven't, I don't think I've been with you before, but I have watched you, <clears throat> you know, um, on things that are recorded uh -huh. online. And uh, my name, my name is Kitty. Can I keep talking? Okay. I didn't think you looked like a Troy. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not. But uh, anyway, I, I've certainly enjoyed listening to you today and uh, the things that I've uh, observed earlier. Not in person, but you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad to have you. Yeah, you're always welcome to join us. and uh, Yeah, thanks for joining. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Ernie and Liz, you're both there. Do you have a question or comment? I just have a comment. I have to say, Eric, it was very practical. It was about mind control. Because you started, you said um, initially, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 11 were, were very important. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God. And then jumping down to the end of verse 5, bringing into captivity every thought. So it was, to me, it was a good um, lesson on mind control. And then you jump to Ephesians, a helmet of salvation. So that thing goes around your head to protect you. So, uh, and just what everybody else has been asking, it's just, it's where your mind is powered by. Is it the flesh or through the power that we have in Christ and the word of God? Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Did, uh, did Ernie have anything? No, no. He, he actually mean... couldn't be here for most of it, so... Okay. I, somebody called me from my old fellow's church. And he was having a big he problem. He was having a big problem, so... so. Uh, he was counseling him. So, anyways... Well, that's, that's good. You can be there to help. You know, Christ can live in yeah. you and, and help that person. So, that's good. That's important that you did that, so... Yeah. No, if I can just get him in the right division, that would be... No. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's baby steps. He's in one step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> well, th thanks, Ernie. Thanks, Liz. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Paula, I see you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or comment? Well, that I could really relate to Adanya's question and what uh, Lisa was saying this week. I have um, had a discussion with my sister who I've been telling about right division for a couple of years and she's been going along with the program because one thing she really did study as being a charismatic Christian was the Bible. It, but she had a different perspective on it. And so this week it came up where I was trying to explain to her about um, Second John uh, 2 and, and just about, you know, talking about Israel. And she, you know, came out of the uh, philosophy, which we've been taught so much through, like what my son has been um, doing through classical conversations, through the Latin-based church, that that was all about Mary. That, it, you know, Mary's, Mary's sister. And I was trying to explain this, and, it, and it's hard because, you know, she's been grasping things, but then she would go back to what we learned when we were kids. And what are you saying that the struggle. are you saying that the elect lady in Second John they're teaching is the is Mary's sister? Is Mary and Mary's sister? Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so that's Catholic based. Okay. That's that's where you know they get that's where they really put a lot of emphasis into Mary because they actually say that's Mary that John is talking about that he was told by Jesus Christ that he was to take care of Mary after Jesus passed. Yeah. Well, when you go back in church history, you find the roots of that. And so I was just trying to explain that to my sister because she was listening to a modern-day evangelist. I won't say his name. But where he got that out of was the Catholic-based system. And I don't know if he was the Catholic, but I'm just saying that so much of what 
that Donya was talking about, we end up going back to stuff that we were told in, in legalism. And we don't mean to. Right. We just automatically do it in, immediately. And um, I just so relate to what she said. We don't mean to. And then I was, after that conversation, I struggled for a whole day. Because <laughs> your, your siblings are very strong. And, and she's quite a bit older than me. And it was like, no, Holly, I started reading my Bible again. Not that I questioned that I was correct. It's just that I just questioned my foundation. Mm-hmm. And so we don't mean to, but you know how I got it back? Because I opened the Word of God. Yeah. And I started reading and, and doing more Bible study. And it just got me back on track again. And, and you know, and my sister still believes that that's Mary that John's talking about. And, and just to love her anyway. Right. And to realize that, you know, maybe she'll come around, maybe she won't. But that it's not really my job. And that... Uh, I can do my best, but not to take it personally. And because I did, I took it personally for about a day. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. I'm glad you shared that. That what you just shared is a practical application of verse six, Second Corinthians ten six that we didn't get to today. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, you're obeying the casting down every casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted the self against the knowledge of God. So you're obeying that, but your flesh wars against your spirit, lust against the spirit, and these and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. So then you end up spending a day, basically, in your mind, and what you need to do is have that readiness to revenge the disobedience, the, the attack of the flesh against what you know, the foundation of what who you are in Christ into the spiritual things. And the second John is not... Mary and her sister and all that crazy stuff. Uh, so that, that's that's the verse 6. So you cast down the imaginations and every high thing. <coughs> and then there's the attack by the flesh and the world and everything. And so then you have the readiness to revenge the disobedience, which is what you did when you got back into the Word and established that foundation. So that's a great... I'm glad you shared that because that, that would be... That's a perfect illustration of verse 6. You just did verse 6 there. Because uh, a lot of times you read verse 6, you think, what in the world does that mean? A readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled? It's what you just said right there. It is, your obedience was fulfilled, but then you got these doubts because of how your mind is, how the world is, and all this stuff. And so then you revenge the disobedience of your flesh by getting back into the Word. So, yeah, I'm glad you shared that. Thanks, Paula. Thanks. Uh, how's Ryan yeah. doing? There he is. Good to see you, Ryan. Did you have anything, Ryan? Uh, Nathan was his high school teacher down in San Juan Capistrano oh. with the conferences. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you're breaking up, Ryan. What, what did he say? <laughs> he just perked up when he saw Nathan pull the Oh, yeah. Yeah, Nathan, uh, Nathan joined us. I think he's going to try to join us now on Sunday morning, so that, that'll be good. Yeah. yeah, I know he can't join at night because of the time difference for him. You know, he's still at work, and, you know, we start earlier, so maybe, maybe we'll see more of him. So, yeah, that, that was good. Yeah, Nathan's a, Nathan's a dear brother in the Lord. You know, he's, uh, I'm 46, and he's 45, and it seems like you know, because we're about the same age, we had a lot of stuff going on at the same time, you know, when... When I'm getting out of legalism, he's getting out of legalism. You know, when he's, you know, it seems like all these things, when I bought a house, he bought a house. It just seemed like all these things go together. So uh, he's, a, he's a good friend, good brother in the Lord. So, Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Lenny and Lisa, did you, you had something? I wanted to say something about Nathan, too. Um, oh, okay. When I was talking and you were answering the question so incredibly, and this is so incredibly... I want to say freeing, but life-giving to me, to know that guilt is not of God. It is unbelievably life-giving to me. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, I, uh, while, while you were talking, I was like, man, I want to, while Nathan's on, I want to let him know how he's teaching. When he taught in the conference in 2020 in December, how when he taught in the spiritual circumcision, how that impacted my life, 
And then I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about that right now because I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> and now he's gone. Wow. And when I saw that he was gone, I'm like, guilt just went, guilt. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. I'm guilt just went. <laughs> and then I went, you know, we can call him this afternoon. We had his story on our plate. We had a one on one. Thank you, Nathan. Thank yeah. you for your love of the Lord. And isn't that incredible? Yeah, that's right. Recognizing that's not of God. It's not the end of the world. Lisa, you're not bad. You didn't mess up. <laughs> let's bring some wonderfulness from this. And let's call that man and speak to him one on one. I just had to share that. Yeah, that's and good. He'd probably appreciate it more. Or, if, you know, you could always, I think he'll be on next Sunday if he has the chance. So maybe, you know, tell him then in front of the, the yeah. Q&A. How, however you want to do it. Yeah. Don't, don't need to is feel guilty. Of, yes. Is that a way of revenging disobedience? Like, I've been into that guilt. Like, no. Does yeah. Don't need to, is that a way? Because I've never understood that verse. Yeah, the disobedience is basically, it's your flesh cropping up. And, you know, Paul is going to go into chapter 11. He's going to talk about all the suffering. So you got out there, uh, especially for us, a good application is it's very easy for our flesh to say, am I doing the right thing and staying home and not going to a physical church and looking at Zoom and I'm not, you know, I'm not going along. I've been taught all this stuff about churchianity and all this stuff. And that seems like in my flesh, that seems like what I should do. And I'm not doing that stuff. I'm not attending a church. I'm I'm reading God's Word. I'm believing God's Word over a doctrinal statement or whatever a, a church says. And your flesh is going to question that. And so basically, revenging disobedience is whenever the flesh crops up and says, well, wait a minute, you should be doing this other thing because Galatians 5.17 says, the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The flesh has been trying all your life to do what God wants you to do and it's failed every single time and then the spirit of christ comes in and when you let the spirit of christ control you you're serving god and so then your flesh lusts after that it gets mad so then it tries to do it so then what it does is it tries to get you to disobey so that's yeah that's a great example is you're listening you're understanding things but then here's your flesh coming along and you feel guilty so the way so then the guilt because everything is in your mind. You don't sin with an action. You sin in your mind. So now you're sinning by thinking, oh, I feel guilty about not telling that to Nathan. And then you revenge that disobedience by going back to, oh, wait a minute. It's okay. Christ died for those sins. I'm not going to be guilty. I'm just going to let Christ live in me. And I'll tell him some other time. I'll call him or I'll tell him next week. Or I'll... So then, yeah, that's a way of revenging disobedience. And disobedience is living by the flesh. The obedience is living by who you are in Christ. And whenever you live by who you are in Christ, you do casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself. When you do that, then your flesh lusts against the Spirit and it's going to try to get you back to disobeying. And so you revenge the disobedience. You get revenge against your flesh getting you out of the Spirit by getting back into God's Word and having... Uh, and you're ready. You've got that doctrine. Say, wait a minute. I'm already completed in Christ. I'm already forgiven. I don't have to feel guilty about that. The blood of Christ purged my conscience. And so you've revenged the disobedience that occurred with your flesh and got back into walking in the Spirit. Yeah, that, that's what that verse means. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, who's that? Oh, Kitty. Yes, go ahead. I'm back. Uh, yes, um, uh, I had to come back in because I remembered something. In one of the things I listened to you um, and I have a problem with memory, but in you were, it, it, it was when you were teaching and you had, like you were on number 18, and I can't tell you exactly what it was, but it had to do with, you mentioned gospel relating to more than um, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, you mentioned, you called other things gospels. Okay. And I'm thinking in terms of um, like other dispensational as gospel, like Moses, gospel. Anyway, you mentioned about okay. five or six times gospel. Okay. Okay. I took that to, um, I, ex I, what you said, I accepted and believed, and I think I understood at least. I can't just, I can't tell you what I understood, but in my mind, I, I, I know I understood. It made sense to me, is what I'm saying. 
But I've just recently gotten involved with a very, very, very highly intelligent woman, young woman, and she uh, writes books, and she's just really, really smart, and is a believer, but um, it has no, her, her training has all been like Catholic. It was in Greek Orthodox, so oh. it's, been, you know, a lot like Catholic. And right. I send her, I forwarded your, what I had seen you do, I forward that to her, and we talked about several things, but you using the term gospel, and like I said, I think it was three or four times in different, referring to different aspects, and um, she had a real hard time with that, so I wondered if you could help me. I just accepted it when you said, uh, referred to, you know, because it, it, to me it's like, you know, a dispensation in the yeah, you know, it was what was going on in Genesis, and then it was Moses. And do you remember that? I don't remember that teaching, but I can. But basically, I was saying there's a like a, Moses taught a gospel that was different from yes. what Jesus' gospel was, or what Paul's gospel that that type of thing. Yes, except okay. you didn't you didn't re, you didn't teach it that way. You okay. just used that term. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So how does the gospel, how, how can I explain that to her? Okay, um, I would say it has to do with progressive revelation. Um, the, the word gospel, the word gospel just means good news. Right, or, and or she did about that, because she's got the Greek, so she understood that. Okay. Okay, so gospel equals good news, but way we usually use it, and with scripture usually uses it, it's the gospel or the good news of how you are saved. And that's how I was using it. So, uh, okay, hang on. So it, it's, the, it, it's the way you were saved. Okay. It, usually, that's it. Yeah, the, the word gospel in itself just means good news. So like, right. like Colossians 2.10, I'm complete in Christ. That's gospel. That's good news. Uh, but it's not usually how we use it. I wouldn't refer to Colossians 2.10 and say, well, that's the gospel. I mean, it's good news. But the way I use it usually, the way we use it, is the good news, basically, of your salvation. How so? Um, you know, how are you saved? Well, you got to believe the gospel. It would be usually the answer. A generic answer of how you are saved is believe the gospel. Right, but but but, yeah. but the way it was, because she understood that, and okay. but her problem was in the other. Uh, in the other part of it, where you refer to gospel, uh, because it was it was not. I mean, it, it didn't appear to be regarding salvation. Um, it appeared to be what like Moses had to say, you know, and and uh, um, like I said, the, okay. the, t the divisions when the rules change, you know. Oh, okay. When the rules change. Yeah, but you yeah. used the term gospel, so I didn't know yeah. exactly how to explain the term. Okay, well, yeah, I would say for that then, if we're not talking about salvation, but if I use the term gospel, it was just basically good news. Uh, so, like, um, and usually... Well, Moses was under, I mean, they were under the law, right? Right. That was their plan for salvation, was under the law, right? Well, that's not how they were saved. <laughs> the, the Moses... So the, the news for the good news or gospel of Moses, let's say, is like you could say Exodus 20, for example. The, the news that Jesus, so if, if we say Moses there, um, what the good news he was giving them is uh, the Mosaic law. Okay, hang on. That's, that's okay. So let's say Exodus 20. I so, got you. So here they are. The good news is um, the Ten Commandments, let's say. Okay. okay. Exodus okay. 20. Uh, that's not really how they're saved. Uh, a lot of times we think as right dividers, we think that, well, they had to obey the law. or They're, they're certainly under the law. But remember Galatians 3.24 says the law is our schoolmaster. Um, the law didn't save them. There's good news is that uh, so it can be used, but gospel could be used then as referring to good news. Yes. 
Yeah. In other areas. Yeah. And yeah, I don't remember what I said there, but it sounds like I wasn't talking about salvation. No, so, you are, you okay. it's not, yeah. Yeah, so basically... Because she understood that it was salvation, but it's okay. the, the other application. Yeah, so basically, this Exodus 20 would be a good example. It says, okay. uh, verse 2, Exodus 20, verse 2, uh, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house yeah. of bondage. So there's some good right. news. That's is good that, news. Yeah, here's... Yeah. They're, they're, they're bound for hell. They're unbelievers bound for hell. But here's some good news. I am the Lord thy God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And now I'm going to commit unto you the oracles of God. Verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So this is good yeah, news this to them. That's exactly what she did. That's it. They, I mean, yes, that's, that's exactly. Yeah. Because uh, she understood it very clearly as good news. But the only thing she could tie it to was uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Oh. You know, and so uh, I, I know that's not a heavy duty question, but you know when you when you're talking to somebody and they're trying to learn something, uh, and, and I and I appreciate the fact that you had done what you've done because I never would have noticed that word gospel like that. So I appreciate that, and that helps me tremendously. Yeah, it's basically God doesn't just give the gospel right away to. Uh, to Israel under Moses because they have to learn the lesson of the law first. So they get the good news of, well, I'm the Lord thy God, which I brought thee out of Egypt, and uh, here's some laws, so I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to try to school you, basically, to get you to the point where you will be, you will be justified by faith. Um, the, 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 really, the, uh, trying to think of how to say this. Um, the, the gospel, I mean, the, the, the good news initially is the Mosaic Law, but it's there to teach them to trust in God. They, what, they, what they really need to learn is that they can't save themselves. They can't obey the law perfectly, so they're not, in other words, they're under the law, but the law isn't there to say, okay, if I obey the law, I'm going to be saved. So you don't tie that to the blood of Christ. What you do is you tie that, basically, it's good news, it's an intermediary step to get them to Christ. And let me give you another example that might help. Uh, Matthew 19. Matthew 19, the rich young ruler. Uh, God, basically, the way God does is He meets you where you are. If you've recognized that you're a sinner... God will give you a saving gospel. He'll say, here's some good news. For us today, he'll say, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. So he'll give you that good news. If you haven't recognized your sin, then he's going to give you some other good news to try to get you there. And that's where the law is. So here's the rich young ruler. Matthew 19, 16. Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So the... Ruler isn't asking, how do I get saved? He says, how do I perform in order to earn eternal life, is what he's asking. So Jesus doesn't say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or repent, be water baptized. What he says, well first he says, verse 17, why do you call me good? And then he says, at the end of verse 17, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So here's some good news, rich young ruler. If you keep the commandments, you can have eternal life. So the good news here in Matthew 19, 17, or the gospel, is keep the commandments. Yes. But, of course, we know that he can't do that. Right. So the idea is to teach him. It's given good news to meet him where he's at. And then if he recognizes, I can't do it, well, then Jesus will say, okay, but I can do it. And so, stop trying to do it yourself. Repent. Change your mind. Stop trying to earn your way to heaven and trust in me to do it. And then, be identified with the believers by being water baptized. That's what Jesus would have said. But instead, the man says, verse 20, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? So then Jesus gives him another law. Okay, if you want to be perfect, sell what you have. And he won't do it. 
So he keeps him under the law, keep the commandments, until he learns the lesson of the law, and then he turns to God to save him. So yeah, the gospel, we think of it as how you were saved, and that's certainly what it usually is, but it can also be good news in terms of, well, they're unbelievers in Exodus 20, so the gospel to them is keep the law, or the rich young ruler. What good thing will I do? Well, keep the commandments. That's the gospel to the rich young ruler. And then he learns, okay, well, that's great. God's provided the law, and it's holy. But then I learn that I'm a sinner, so now what do I do? So now you get some further good news. You know, repent and be yes. baptized in that case. So did, yes. did, that, did that help? Did that go along with what yes. I said? Oh, okay. that's, that's exactly, that's, okay. yes, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Okay. And I thank you so much so I can pass that on to her because she's very eager. So okay. So thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you're able to talk with her. I'm glad to help with that answer. So, thank you. That's great. Great, great, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Before I get to Jerry, I think everybody else has had a chance. Before I get to Jerry, did anybody else have anything? Go ahead, Lisa. I just I wanted to say that I loved your teaching on the um, the armor of God. Oh, okay. And I love. I had never thought about that the shield of faith was overcoming religion and legalism. Never, ever thought about that. So that, that has helped me. The, the fiery darts of religion and legalism, that is our faith overcomes that, the shield of faith. And also, I've never thought about prayer being one of the one of the pieces of the armor. So it, that really, that was a great teaching. I want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, it's got, you've got seven weapons there, and the first five are defensive, and the last two are offensive, but it's combined. It's the Word of God and prayer combined together to be that offensive weapon. And, uh, and yeah, a lot of times we think of fiery darts in terms of evil things. It's like, oh, God, uh, the devil wants me to get drunk tonight, or he wants me to lust after that woman, or he wants me to do... It's not... Usually it's not that stuff. It ends up being religious stuff. When we get next week, um, we're going to go uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5. That is just a preview of coming attractions here. Uh, uh Casting down imaginations. Imaginations is knowledge of evil. It's Romans 1. It says over there, and, and you know, if you want to look at this you know, during the week, it says there in Romans 1 and verse 21 that when man did not want to recognize God, they became vain in their imaginations. So casting down imaginations has to do with Romans 1 uh, knowledge of evil. The imaginations is, I'm, I am God. There is no other God. I am God. That's your imagination. And then every high thing, it says, we're also going to cast down every high thing. And that is a reference to Romans 2. The high thing is religion. It is that I can do these works that my religion says to do, and then I'll be okay. And that right there is exactly what Lucifer did. Because over there in Isaiah 14, he says, I will be like the Most High God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the north. I will sit upon uh, the stars of God. I will sit uh, on the sides of the congregation of the north. Uh, he says, I will do all these things. And so that's a high thing. And so what do we do after we're saved? Well, I'm going to serve the Lord. He died for me. I'm going to live for Him. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pay tithes. I'm going to be a member. I'm going to do all these things. That's high things. So what you got in imaginations and high things, you got Romans 1 and you got Romans 2. So you got the knowledge of evil and you got the knowledge of good. And a lot of times we only think of the evil part. We don't think of the good part. So those fiery darts of the wicked can be both. But usually... If you're a Bible-believing Christian, your focus is, or Satan's focus against you is going to be on the, Rome, the Romans 2 stuff, the high thing. And that's what the Corinthians are dealing with. They got rid of their carnality, but now they may get into legalism. So, uh, so yeah, those fiery darts for a Bible-believing Christian, the fiery darts that you use to show the faith against is legalism and religion. Because he doesn't, he, Satan isn't going to tempt me with, you know, when I was buried with committing adultery. There's, there's no way I'm going to do that. But he can tempt me with thinking that I'm higher than I am, you know, and in my mind through a religious activity. So 
that's usually for the Bible believer, the fiery darts are in the, are in the Romans 2 category, not Romans 1. Thank you, Lisa. And the very last thing was you said, use that sword. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. We've got to use the word of God. It is our power against those fiery darts that guilt. The word of God is incredibly powerful. All right. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, and, so and you use the sword through the prayer. Through the prayer. Is right. I'm think the prayer is thinking over that doctrine. That's how I use the mind of Christ. If I just recite Ephesians 1, uh, it doesn't do anything for me. It's just words. But if I think over, wait a minute, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've got forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. I've got wisdom and prudence. Uh, you know, I'm uh, part of the, bar, uh, the body of Christ, and He's far above all principality and power. I'm using then what I'm doing is I'm praying or I'm thinking over that doctrine. And so the way you use the sword is by prayer. Basically just thinking it over, using the mind of Christ. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. It was a great follow-up there. Uh, Ryan, did you have something? And if you could try to get toward the middle of the screen, for some reason, if you're off to the Why side, I, I can't hear you. So. Put the microphone down? Oh, yeah, yeah, now it sounds good, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I want to say there's this uh, uh, certain individual uh, that I'm in, uh, ministering to in archery. Um, uh, he's, he's a very... Uh, He's just starting our jury to do it for a couple months now, and then um, we're just talking to about uh, we just we're talking about how uh, we're Christian like that. And we, uh, he was saying, "Oh, I'm Christian too," and then I'm starting to minister him about uh, because he's first uh, he has he's got step one uh, coming to the knowledge of the truth or uh, sorry uh, be saved, and then he's I'm trying to work on step two coming into the knowledge of the truth. Right. So. Uh, but I've, I've showed it, like, I've uh, quoted a couple verses here and there, and read a couple verses here and there, but it's, like, it's um, it's hard for him to, because he's, um, he's one of those pieces, like I did, where I uh, was at church, and then I um, was shown the doctrine, but I never really uh, read the Bible a lot, like, uh, the first phase a couple of years ago, before I did write division, and he's kind of in that stage, but he also um, went to a church a lot more than I did, so he's got a lot more of a grade of, of Israel. Uh, spiritual Israel, so it's like it's hard for him to, um, to uh, give up spiritual gifts and um, all the miracles and um, signs and wonders. So it's um, it's I just noticed that how it's like for a lot of people it's just hard for yes. them to having because he he said how uh, but it's been taught for so many years. It's like, right. So that's that's why I was um, a comment on how uh, amazing how Satan has really ingrained it in us a lot, how it's, it's hard to give up. Yeah, that's why 2 Corinthians 10.4 says pulling down strongholds. It's a stronghold. Yeah. It's something there. And, you know, the way you get out of it is you just, you have to, and, you know, I, I had it really ingrained in me as well because I was in legalism in that church. I mean, we went uh, when my... My uh, dad left my mom for another woman, and they got divorced. And so anyway, I was two years old when all that happened. And so from two, age two, my mom is taking me to the church. Very legalistic. It was a holiness church. Basically, they're saying, we're, we're a church without spot or wrinkle. We are not going to sin. There are people in the church who said they hadn't sinned in years. And from age two, I'm taught that you've got to do all these things, you know, legalism and if you disobey just one thing even in your mind then you've sinned and you got to ask for forgiveness and so from age of two to the time i learned uh eternal security and right division it's about 17 or 18 so you know and, and you know you're about that age you know that the things that you learn as a child are really hard to get out of so it's ingrained in me and it wasn't i mean we weren't just we were really into the church every time the doors were open we were there sunday morning sunday night wednesday night at minimum They'd also have uh, small group meetings in houses. Uh, we'd have revivals maybe once or twice a year where it went every night for a week or two. Uh, I mean, I'm in that church a lot. I'm learning that. And it's, it's ingrained in me. And so it was very difficult at, you know, probably the age of your friend, probably about the same age I was when I learned like, right uh, division. 22. What's that? Uh, 22. 22, okay. A little, little bit later, but still just a few years later. 
It's very ingrained in you. And so the way to get out of it is you have to say, the Bible is my authority. I'm going to believe the Bible. But your mind, for at age 22, for the last 18 years, let's say, it's been ingrained in you all this legalism. And you just have, so it is a stronghold. It's a stronghold. Uh, and so you just have to tell yourself. It's a mindset. It is, I'm going to believe what God's Word says. You know, just like, like archery, let's say. You're told by your coach, you know, to practice this amount. Or, you know, you hold it a certain way. And, you, and you're, and you're and of course, I'm not into archery, so I don't know all that. But I can tell you, you know, there's a certain way you're going to hold. There's a certain way you're going to release the, the, the bow. The certain release, I'm sorry, you release the arrow there, the bow and the arrow. There's certain ways you do that. And maybe your body doesn't know that, but you've got to train it. You've got to, you've got to get it to where it's muscle memory, to where you just keep doing it over and over, to where now, instead of you doing it wrong, it's just second nature that you're doing it right. But then at the same time, even though you get it right and you're doing good, it's so easy to go back. Uh, where, uh, so you've got to have somebody watching you and say, they'll say, well, wait a minute here, you're not doing it exactly right. And they've got to get you back to the way it is. Uh, way it should be. But it just takes that muscle memory. It takes it just doing it over and over and over the right way. And then, again, you may have little corrections here and there because then your, your body is going to do it the wrong way. And so then you got a coach there to get you back. And that's basically where he is, is that you've got to be in that mindset to where you say, I believe God and His Word. And you just got to do over and over those verses. So like, like I told Don, Colossians 2, Hebrews 9, Galatians 2. Get those verses, write them down, have them in front of you. And, and so for him, it's whatever it is, if it's eternal security or wh whatever the verses are, whatever the stronghold is in his life, what he needs to do is write down those verses that will answer those. And then when he is thinking back in that stronghold, go back to the verses, go back to the verses. And you get to the point where you've done it so much that now it's memorized, it's muscle memory. And so then you don't have to read it on a piece of paper. You know what it is. But you have to make the initial commitment that you say, I'm going to believe God's Word. I know I've been taught all my life for the last 18 years this certain thing, but I know that that is not what God's Word says. And so, yeah, it's going to take some time, but it's just it's a mindset to where you say, I'm going to believe the Bible over my upbringing, over my training. And I'm going to believe God's Word. I'm going to believe what it says. And whenever I have doubts, I'm going back to that. And, and until he gets to that point, then he's not really going to overcome the things, those strongholds. The way you pull down the strongholds is just a repetition of God's Word that's going to go against the, that religion or that stronghold. So. Yes, thank you. So th th thank you, Ryan. Yeah, um, it's, um, yeah I'm trying to tell him about uh, my book. Bible is my final authority, and then just yeah, trying to pull down the strongholds. And, uh, it's just even even when I present the evidence, it was just uh, like a present um, like the middle wall partition been taken down. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile today, and how um, you're not uh, spiritual Israel. And then, uh, but he does believe about the um, uh, the full um, uh, God, um, full. He's fully saved, so like he believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But, um, but he does believe in that, how you have to um, constantly um, ask for forgiveness, stuff like that. But that um, so it, it's, uh, thank you for uh, saying how I'm uh, pulling down strongholds, and it's um, going back to the Bible as your final authority. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's going to work regardless of what the stronghold is. Yeah, I can tell you, I learned... Uh, Right division. When I was about seventeen or eighteen, I went to the church for seven years, and uh, I learned all the thing. Like if you wanted to say the you know the chart that John Verstegen uses, uh, I saw that for the first time. I was about thirty two at the time. Um, I knew all that information on that chart because I learned right division thirteen fourteen years beforehand, uh, so I knew the information. Um, but the issue is that when I learned right division, they did not teach the Bible as the final authority. So I had the information, but it was just because that's what they taught. You know, they didn't say the King James Bible is God's preserved word in English without error, and they didn't go back to verses to prove their point. They had the correct doctrine, but they didn't have the Bible as their authority. When I got into John's church, um, he really hammered home the Bible as the authority. 
And that's when I really began to grow. I mean, I understood right division. I understood the doctrine at 18. Um, I could give you the whole chart from memory by the time I'm 25 because I've been in it for seven years. But as far as growth, as using the mind of Christ to apply it in situations and overcoming strongholds, that really takes place when you make the Bible your final authority. And that's what I learned uh, at John Burke Stegan's church. That, that's why John is such an instrumental in my life and my growth. It's just learning that concept. So if there is a way, like you said, you've been trying to do that. If there's a way you can get him to make the Bible his final authority, uh, that's where the growth is going to be. Even though doctrinally he understands some things, uh, the way he really overcomes that stronghold is through God's Word and understanding that's what it is. And it's not about, well, the church says this or Ryan says this. It's, well, no, God's Word says this. It doesn't matter what I was brought up. God's Word says this. And when he makes that commitment, that's where the true growth will happen. So, yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan, for sharing that. Uh, anybody have anything else before yeah. I go to Jerry? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Um, I thought I'd pray for, for Paul, for Ryan. And what's your friend's name, Ryan? Uh, Michael. Michael. Okay. I thought, is it okay if I pray for Yeah, you? That's, that's good. Okay, he, yeah, he, and the, he is, and the inner man. He'll be changed to the inner man. Awesome, yes. and he, he is a believer in Christ. He's believed the gospel, correct? Yes. Michael, the, uh, Michael, the full okay. gospel. Yep. Or the, um, Beautiful. That's awesome. Father God, it is so incredible to hear this testimony of Ryan. Ryan's heart to want to share the gospel of Christ with his friends, with the people he meets, Lord. It's a testimony to all of us of Christ in Ryan being an ambassador for you, Father an ambassador of Christ. Lord, I pray for his friend Michael. I thank you that, as Ryan has testified, he has believed the gospel of Christ, that Christ died for his sins, was buried and rose again the third day. How incredibly precious, Lord. He's in Christ. Father, I pray that as Ryan continues to speak truth and love to him, that Michael's spiritual eyes will be opened. And as Eric said, Scripture, Lord, I pray, Father, that Michael will read your word and believe it and let it renew his mind, let it change his mind, change his thinking, let the word do its work and change his mind, Father. Father, I pray you show Michael the futility, the, the emptiness of religion and man's traditions and the teachings that are not worse today, Father. They don't work. I, I just pray, Father, that... Um, that your word will have its work in Michael. And I just thank you again that, that Ryan has this desire for Michael to come into the knowledge <coughs> of the truth. We, we, we rejoice with, with Ryan, and we pray this, giving you all the praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that prayer, Lisa. Um, does anybody have anything else before I go to Jerry? Call in once, call in twice. Okay, Brother Brown, you want to close this out? Okay, thank you. Really, it was really a uh, sit back and watch uh, what happened here today, which your, your teaching was really, really good, Eric. Um, it's going to help a lot of people out there. And then the... Uh, continuation of it in the Q&A, how when Danya uh, expressed her uh, problems that we all have one way or another. Yes. We have them as we're coming out of this mind renewal, we're coming into a mind renewal, Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's a journey that will continue, <clears throat> but teachings like you just did just springboards us forward. As we've been around these, these scriptures for years, excuse me, <coughs> But a good, solid teaching like you just did and brought out so much that ties a lot of the uh, missing links together. And then we go into Q&A and Danya expresses her heartfelt problems that she did. And then Lisa comes back as uh, she did and expands on that, which then goes back and Danya says after Lisa's finished that how much the Q&A and what Lisa did and it just uh, expanded like that. And I'm telling you, to sit back here and watch that happen was really, really uh, encouraging. 
that the work of God is going on when you get that word rightly divided that was taking place today. And just like one day I was listening to a teacher, I called the old man, Richard Jordan, although I'm, I am uh, six years older than him, he's still the old man. <laughs> he's, been in, uh, he's been out there uh, taking arrows a lot, a lot longer than I have. And uh, he's, he's a kid. But uh, he said one day, that, and it's a common little statement, but it's so helpful to me, the only thing that stops death, excuse me, the only thing that stops sin is death. Boom. And I caught it. Yeah. I caught the spiritual truth of that, and that's the death, burial, and resurrection, the death of our Savior. And the sin issue is D-O-N-E. Uh, in the uh, spirit world for a believer. But the believer has to come to a knowledge of that, which is what was taking place here this morning with your teaching. And you present yourself before someone who is ahead of you, as you are, Eric, and lead us in this, and uh, take it in, and write it, divide it, and look at it, study it, and then believe it. So the issue, the only thing that stops sin is death. The moment you believe, that issue is over. The sin issue is over in the spirit. But then we begin to learn that there's another sin issue that's in our flesh, Galatians 5, 16 and there, and all over. We're, we're, we're taught thoroughly about the body of flesh, Philippians 3.21 is vile, and all the things. That will continue until death shows up to this body. The only thing that's going to stop sin in this body is the physical death. Right. And that day, it will stop sinning, yeah. and we escape it, finally. And uh, so that's helped me over the years, and... Uh, Going to share that with you guys. Yeah, thank you for that. I wrote it on the board. The only thing that stops sin is death. And a good cross-reference, Romans 8.3, uh, for sin, that uh, Jesus condemned sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He put it to death. So, uh, yeah. And then we, by faith, have to reckon it. Romans 6.11. And that's your daily, yes. and the, the list that she gave Donya to rehearse in her mind. And that's the way we're going to do it. We reckon these things to be true. And and uh, and that casting down uh, scriptures at you end helps the believer get through that warfare daily as we cast them down. Know where they're coming from. It's the body of sin, and so this this will continue to be a real good, helpful lesson for all of us too, um, and for many people out there in YouTube land, Eric. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate that. Lisa? I wanted to say that um, you were talking about John Verstegen and Jerry just mentioned YouTube land. Last night on the conference, John Verstegen taught, um, he used the wild word of war, the world of sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And he changed it to the agony of victory. And it was just a profound mm -hmm. message um, through our struggles in life, through the things that we want just to be done over with, we can come to life in Christ. And we have no, no longer self-confidence, but Christ confidence. And I'm sure it's going to be on shorewoodbiblechurch.org, their website, his teaching. So for those listening or any of y'all, I mean, it was just, it was a great message. So I just wanted to say that for anyone that would want to watch that. And he put, yeah. he put the thrill, I'm going to, well, he wrote the, the agony of, victory and then he expounded on that in a beautiful way yeah that sounds good i meant to i meant to watch that last night but just didn't get a chance so i think uh yeah maybe i can find it on youtube and uh, email it to you lisa and then send it out i know they put the they have them on their their website usually they have the audio versions but then they'll put the video on the on the uh, on the youtube channel so uh. okay awesome eric, eric uh, go ahead Don. go oh, ahead thank, i'm sorry jerry I just wanted to thank Eric again, but also to thank Lisa. She has been a lifesaver to me. She puts up with me. She's so patient. She's 
It says she's going to send me some Bible verses, and there's just a lot of other things that she does. She's, she and Jerry both stay in touch with me and encourage me, and that's a godsend. It's a real gift. But and I don't want that to just go over uh, what I'm saying about Eric. A lot of that has just changed my life, and it's a process, but I see the process working. And I see whose names are on it. So thank you, Eric and Lisa and Jerry. And, and the feedback here with the group, that's great too. Thank you. Yeah, I think these Q&A sessions really help because it's not just me teaching. Christ lives in all of us. And uh, you know, Lisa's able to share Christ in her. You know, the great thing about it is Christ uses our individual personalities and he uses them to his glory. Um, I can say things a certain way, but maybe, like like Lisa mentioned, that there was a message on the spiritual circumcision that Nathan did a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, I may say the same thing, but it's just that maybe the way he words it or maybe his life experiences and everything go into that. And the Christ in him, in that message, ministers to Lisa uh, in a profound way that maybe it didn't do through me. But then maybe through me, it reaches somebody else. And so that's the wonderful thing about Christ is he uses our personalities, our experiences and everything, and Christ comes through us and reaches different people in different ways, and it all just comes together as, uh, you know, edifying the entire body. So, yeah, th thanks yeah, to everybody. That, yeah. yeah, and all of that motivates the questions and discussion and helps us to see other sides and angles. Great. Thank you. Yeah. To God be the glory. Thank you. Yeah. All right, if nobody has anything else, I guess we'll say good night and uh, see you tomorrow night, our Monday night study. We're doing our Bible overview, so we'll be talking about Noah. So uh, anyway, hope to see you then. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Good night.